I've wanted to make this video for quite some time and that is about engine break-in. You buy a brand new car, what do you do? There's a lot of misconceptions about this, a lot of myths, and there's varying opinion on how you should do it. All the way from you drive the car like you stole it to the opposite extreme where you should baby the car for a thousand plus miles just to make sure everything's running. And the truth is it's somewhere in between and it's largely dependent on the manufacturer, the type of engine it is, the construction, and the, the, the target of what you're going to be doing with it later on. So here it is. Your commodity engines, the things that are made in the hundreds of thousands or millions mass produced, those engines are designed to come out of the factory, put in a car, and the customer, the end user, is going to drive it right off the lot. And there's not a lot of break-in required with that because they're designed, they don't have the crazy tight tolerances. Esoteric parts are designed for high performance aspirations. Like you're, you're literally taking a CRV or an Equinox or Chevy Malibu and you're just, you're putting it on the highway. Most people are not going to go you know, drive it flat out on a track or something. So the, the way that you handle that is much different compared to something like a new Z06, where you have a high revving engine, a Ferrari engine, or a Porsche GT3, a Type R, uh, a BMW M engine. So those require a little bit of different treatment. So there's some misconception that manufacturers take these high performance engines, some of them that are hand-built or partially hand-built, and they break them in in the factory. And that's simply not the case. Even some of the high-strung engines, like we talked to the Corvette engineers, that Z06 gets hand-built and then is dynoed, but it's more of a quality gate. It's doing some RPM sweeps and different load, getting it up to temperature, making sure there's no leaks, coolant, oil, making sure there's no catastrophic failures, and they might do one near high RPM pull, but that's about it. It's not sitting there for like three days being run in. It's just to make sure the engine's safe to go back in the car. And most of the high performance engines don't even get that treatment. So it's really kind of on the buyer to understand, you know, there are some things that you should be doing when you get this new car just to keep it safe if you're keeping it for the long term. So the next thing is, what should you be doing? Well, engine design and modern manufacturing is not like it was 20 years ago. And even oil design, the, the quality of oil has just dramatically gone up in terms of stability and durability. So getting a, a modern engine now, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of how you treat the engine. But here's kind of the gold standard from some of the engineers we spoke to. You should constantly, if, as soon as you drive it off the lot, you want a very load, which means you don't want to sit at a constant RPM on the highway for like hours on end. You don't want to get out there just keep it at you know 75 miles an hour at 2000 RPM. You wanna to try to get varying loads. So that means getting on the throttle, getting the RPMs up, changing the speed, slowing the car down. Conversely, you don't wanna be at the high RPM range when the engine is new. So you don't wanna thermally shock an engine like taking it to the track right away where you get outside the envelope of normal operating temperatures at extreme high temperatures and then thermally shocking all the systems, like taking it to 270 degree oil temp and then cooling it down right away to ambient. Those are some of the stressful things, most stressful things that an engine can endure. So you wanna keep it within the normal operating range, varying load, a little bit of higher RPM, not to redline, not banging off the rev limiter, but also not sitting there lugging the engine. And typically you wanna to try to do that for about two or 300 miles before the engine is broken in. And from talking to engineers more so on the high performance side, the concept is it, it revolves around the running parts or the moving parts of the engine. The running surfaces need to, time to adjust to even wear. And it, it just makes a lot of sense if you think of it practically. If you're running outside or you're doing some basketball drill where all you're doing is cutting right, cutting right, cutting right, you're gonna start to put strain on one side of your knee, you're gonna start putting strain on one side of your body that's not evening out load, which could result into an injury. In terms of mechanical parts, a lot of this initial break-in process is because of bearings or running material. Bearings, because of removing of lead in some of materials now, like there's no copper in brake pads, because of regulations, they've had to reformulate a lot of these running surfaces or friction materials to comply with you know regulatory so when you remove lead and things there's not as much give in the bearings that are a lot harder 
So if you have a high vibration engine, typically you want to try to make sure you don't overload the engine, thermally shock the engine and create a high or a low side on that bearing or the running surfaces in between. But they do take a little bit of time to break in and the breaking in is simply providing the, the clearance to make sure that oil film always stays intact. So a crankshaft is this machine, you know, it's got machine surfaces, the, the crank board uh, and the bearing machine, the bearings are machined and they have their running surfaces, but they take a little while to bed in. And you want to remove the high spots, the polishing with some light load, uh, varying the engine speed and load. So all those little high spots are, are knocked down and polished. So you have a really good uh, layer of bearing uh, on the crankshaft. Um, and that break-in process provides uh, really consistent clearance between the bearing and the crankshaft. Uh, so that under high speed, high load, high temperature, you never worry about breaking down that film. But all bearings and all new machine parts, they do have a little bit of disparities in them and it takes a little while for that stuff to knock down and move around. Uh, the magic with the bearings, um, and the bearing suppliers will tell you this, they have all these their secret recipes with uh, a top layer that's uh, pretty much malleable. It's not as malleable as lead, but it also uh, does absorb uh, any contaminants, any debris that may be in the build, be in the engine, be in the oil as well as uh, move around uh, based on the, the engine's load and the polishing and the break-in so that what they call is they call it an adapt so the bearing adapts it moves and provides clearance where there needs to be clearance uh, and that's the whole break-in process so um, what, what the bearing manufacturers really look for is they want varying speed varying load and they want to give a lot of time for the bearing to cool off because a hot bearing as it's trying to break in uh, can sometimes scuff so they like the varying load and not going too high speed, too high load for the first 500 miles. And we found that for most street driving, you, know, you can do a zero to 60, you can do a couple of watts, but you're not able to put as much speed and load like you can on a racetrack that really gets the temperatures up there and keeps things consistently hot and consistently loaded. Now you may be somebody that doesn't have a high performance application, but a lot of these same ideas are there for things like a Toyota Camry or a uh, a Kia Telluride in some of the mainstream cars, you want to take it off the showroom floor and you want to safely get that thing up to temperature before you start ragging on it. You don't want to just let it sit there and idle for five to 10 hours at a time. And you don't want to drive it on the highway at just a constant speed. You want to try to bring the engine up. You want to try to get some revolutions in the engine, get up to speed, bring it back down. Again, trying to cycle through to get some of that even wear built up for the first 200 miles. You know, even if you, you can't do that, try to do it for the first 100 or 200 miles, and you typically are good. Now, when we're talking about heat cycling, the engine isn't the only reciprocating part or moving part on a car. Re regardless, you have suspension, you have braking system, you have a transmission or a variation of a transmission on modern cars. So you want to take the same care with those. So as a part of that break-in, you're helping break in other moving parts. And again, when I'm talking about thermal cycling or thermal shock, it's about not getting that entire drivetrain or car parts to that high level of thermal load where parts start to heat soak when they're brand new. You wanna run them in gradually. So it's the same thing with a transmission. You don't wanna get it to its most extreme temperature and then shock it thermally by letting it completely cool off. It's the same thing with a braking system. We talk about this a lot. You get brakes super hot. That's tr traditionally not the problem with braking systems. It's when you get them super hot and then let them get ice cold and then thermally shock them again with high load. You know, you want to build up that temperature until you get a pad layer so you're not, you know, creating a heavy, heavy thermal cycle on those parts. That's what wears them out prematurely. So if you think about it the same way with like, the friction materials versus engine and transmission, some of those same things can be done there. After talking to some of the Corvette engineers, they said straight up, you know, this concept of braking in an engine, you know, you drive it like you stole it. That doesn't make a lot of sense on a streetcar because if you look at statistically where most engines live on a streetcar, it's not at six or seven or 8,000 RPM. It's not even like 4,000. It's generally isolating right around like 2,000 RPM. The average speed of most vehicles once they're on the road in real world driving settles around like 30 miles an hour, maybe even lower than that for some people. So the engine is not living its life at the high RPM. So you don't want to break it in where you're sitting there at a high load. It just doesn't make any sense. Street cars are not race cars. So think about that when you're doing it and kind of adjust your mentality a bit. The last topic is oil. 
if you're a normal person, you have a regular car, you follow the manufacturer recommended schedule. You know, there's, there's lights that tell you, hey, you're due for an oil change. Follow that. Go to the dealership, use the factory recommended oil. You'll never think about it. It's easier that way. Oil has improved in durability. The science behind oil has changed so much in 20 years. The additive packs, they, they last longer. The engines, the modern engines of today, have far less contamination. So you don't have to worry about these accelerated intervals where people are like, oh, you change your oil every 3,000 miles. That's just not the case in modern engines anymore. It's, it's almost wasteful to do that. You can run safely 8, 10, even 15,000 miles, depending on your climate. So that's one side of it. But you have to think about, okay, I'm cold starting my engine every day outside at you know, zero degrees Fahrenheit. I'm getting the engine heated up to 180 degrees and then I'm cooling it back off to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a lot of thermal cycling on that engine. It's a lot of work on that oil in terms of the additive packs to keep the running surfaces safe. So you might, might have to do an accelerated oil change to be safe. Same thing with heat. If you're in the Arizona area and it's 120 degrees and that engine oil is constantly running way above its temperature range, you should probably be changing it sooner if you're in a dusty environment. Again, there's these extremes you have to look out for to protect your engine, namely when it's new. Um, there's this concept of, well, you should change your oil right away when the engine is brand new, right? There could be contaminants from the assembly process, which is far less common nowadays. The, the typical thing you see in new oil, or in oil samples from cars that are brand new is just sealers, like silicone from the assembly process. There might be some assembly lube or, or different contaminants in there, but usually it's silicone. And the only thing with silicone is, you know, it might change the pH a bit, but in engines like Subaru, where there's a lot of silicone, that silicone actually might trap contaminants or metal and create scoring problems or oil starvation if it gets in an oil gallery. So that would be a good case where maybe, depending on the car, you should change your oil at a thousand miles to be safe to start. And then those that silicone level will drop debris and another thing you have in the initial oil change is you get a little bit of silicone in the oil from the rtv curing um, that's part of the sealing of the engine and that is a i don't want to say inhibitor but it encourages oil aeration which isn't good so that that first oil change is a way to expel that from the engine so the last thing i will say is eco oil eco oils what is that so zero w20 zero w16 they're, con they're compliance oils designed to help with fuel economy and lower emissions. Manufacturers use them because there's far less pumping losses involved in it. And it really does help with fuel economy because it flows thin at cold temperatures and it flows thin at high temperatures. The negative part about that is if you have an enthusiast car, they are not designed to be operated at high temperature. There's very few cars that even at track temperatures or high temperatures can thermally balance themselves where that oil temperature stays below 220 degrees Fahrenheit, unless you have a really, really great car with amazing cooling. Regular sports cars are gonna hit 250, 260, maybe even 270 on oil temps. And when you get 020 or 0W16 to those extreme temperatures, they suffer greatly. They thin out so much that you can run into high levels of pressure loss. That's why you would not wanna run an eco oil on a high performance car, namely when it's new. And just as a side note, 020 or a 016 oil, they typically have more oil evaporation. They call it NOAC. It's the measurement of oil evaporation. They're typically above 7%. And that oil evaporation on 0W oils also can contribute to carbon deposits. And every engine manufacturer is different. Some engines typically get more car carbon deposits, uh, namely in direct injection motors versus other brands. Depends on their head design, their coolant, and it, it, there's a lot of factors involved in it. But the, the mass majority, 99% of 0W20 oils have more oil evaporation than an oil that's 5W20 or 5W30. So that's something else. If you're running oil at very, very high temperatures, you're gonna have more oil evaporation with the eco oils. And th that's the last part of the oil discussion. A 0W20 oil tends to thin out far greater than a 5W20 oil. And you know, people talk about, well, the five and the zero mean nothing with high temperatures. Well, the base stock of those oils, the friction modifiers or viscosity modifiers in zero W20 oils to get it to have that flow rate at cold temperatures affects the high temperature viscosity. 
And when I'm saying high temperature, I'm not talking about 200. I'm talking about 230 degrees, 240 degrees plus Fahrenheit. Those zero W20 oils will thin out more at the higher temperature than a five W20 oil. It's just that compromise and making an all weather design. So what does this all mean really at the end of the day, based on the engineers we talked to, vary the load on the engine when it's new. Don't sit at a constant RPM. Don't thermally shock the engine. And then of course, if you're planning on keeping the engine long-term or this car long-term that you're buying and put a lot of money in, definitely follow that. If you're just leasing the car, then you don't care about any of this. You just want to get through 30,000 miles, beat the hell out of it, but maybe think about the future owner of it too. You know, eat that first three to 500 miles to be safe. That's up to you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.